today once again you can see we're live from Mr. D's living room and we're going to cover the scientific method in this one and this is really the most important concept in chapter one um, the second one would be the characters of life but we're really going to really hit the scientific method hard because this is the tools the step-by-step -step process that a scientist is going to use every day in the laboratory or every day in the field to do his job and remember their job is to gather knowledge and incorporate it into what we already know as a human all right so let's get down to this all right well first of all what is the scientific method and really it's the techniques for investigating phenomena we're going to cover what phenomena is coming up but it's basically stuff that happens and we're going to use this to acquire new knowledge we're going to use this to correct things that we thought were true but they're no longer there and I think this is one of the neatest things about science science is not so arrogant to think that they know everything we are more than willing to take some new knowledge and integrate it into what we already know and there's not a lot of things out there in humankind that actually do this that well but science by design is always look to correct things that they're not sure or they're very welcoming of new knowledge most of the time we'll talk about that as we go through the year but most of the time that's true all right so what are the steps of the scientific method <clears throat> well the first thing is you got to observe the phenomena you've got to see what's happening out there in the world the second thing is scientists are always curious once they see something they create a question um, why did this happen when is it going to happen again um, how did it do it okay from any question you always get it. you're searching for an answer and in science the answer is a hypothesis that's a possible answer now to test to see if your answer is true or incorrect we do what is called a controlled experiment now from the controlled experiment we're going to get data and this data is used to make a conclusion and the conclusion is basically was your hypothesis correct or not did your hypothesis predict why or how the phenomenon occurred in the first place okay and the next thing you're going to do is you're going to repeat it because you want to make sure that your data wasn't a fluke and then finally once you are pretty sure that your data is not a fluke then you're going to go through a process of peer review all right now I have a neat little mnemonic device that allows you to remember the steps of the scientific method it's kind of weird kind of funny but it worked for me all right so it's known as OC the funny carp as you can see here carp is spelled c-a-r-p it's a fish so OC the funny carp observe create a question form a hypothesis controlled experiment analyze the data repeat and then peer review oh see the funny carp All right now over here we got a graphic that pretty much puts a little bit different spin on this you have your initial observation which is the you know phenomenon that you've seen you formulate a question that's the hypothesis you do an experiment to test your hypothesis you make a conclusion based upon your data you either accept the hypothesis or you reject it now if you reject it you got to go back to the hypothesis we need to rewrite it and then you're going to redo your experiment and you're going to publish in a journal and then that's going to go through the peer review all right so let's look at all these in a little bit more detail all right there we go next slide all right observation of phenomena remember our first step O C the funny carp that's the o so what are phenomena well they're just stuff that happens they're facts or occurrences that can be observed you're going to use your five senses to observe and to see this phenomenon all right let's brush that away all right creating a question once you see the phenomenon as a scientist is going to be very curious now, I know this looks like an S but it's actually a five okay the five W's and the one H the who the what the when the where and why and how now what's really important is that a good question is going to create a good hypothesis all right so let's move on to the next one all right for a hypothesis the definition of a hypothesis a lot of you are going to think of you know it's a educated guess because you've heard that in all your science classes I'm not very fond of that of that uh, definition I like this one better 
it's a possible answer to why it occurred. And essentially, it's a prediction because the scientist expects it to be correct. He expects that his prediction is going to come true. So it's not quite a guess. He really understands, or she understands, why this is going to occur. Now, you're going to write it as an if-then statement. All right. Now, the if part is the manipulated or independent variable. Some books use manipulated, some use independent. I believe the book that we use, which is Miller Levine's Biology, it's got the parrot on the front, very uh, popular book in the United States. They use the word independent. The then part refers to the responding or the dependent variable, which is used by our book. All right, we're going to go over these in more detail a little bit later in this screencast. All right, what is a controlled experiment? This is what is used to test the hypothesis. Now, in a controlled experiment, there's going to be two groups. Now, these are really hard to remember. Okay, in a controlled experiment, you have the control group, and then you're going to have the experimental group. Very easy to remember. Now, the control group doesn't have any variables. It's used for comparison. The experimental group, and this is where the stuff is happening. This is where you put in the variables. And a variable is basically what you are testing. Here we go, got caught up. All right, so over here in this picture, as you can see in this one right here, here's her control group. And I don't know, you think those are lemons or something right there? All right, so in here, we're going to say no lemons. And over here in these two groups, this lady is going to add the lemons. All right, so maybe in group A, she's going to add, she's going to squeeze one lemon. Maybe over here, she's going to squeeze two lemons. So maybe she's going to measure which one is going to be more acidic, two lemons or one lemons, right? But, you know, that, that's not real important in this comparison. Basically, over here, once again, in your control group, no variables, totally for comparison. In these two groups, you're going to add a variable. And out of these variables, you're going to get some, you're going to observe some type of change, hopefully, and that change is going to lead to the collection of data. All right, fourth part. What are the variables? Now, remember, we talked about this before, we were talking about how we wrote our hypothesis. There's a manipulated variable, and there's a responding variable. Our textbook uses the word independent and dependent. <clears throat> but I think the manipulated and responding say it a little bit better, but we'll, we'll incorporate them both. All right, now, the manipulated variable is deliberately changed. In other words, man caused something to happen. And this is the difference between the control and the experimental group. It's exactly, whoops, we went too far. Let's go back here. Hit the wrong button back here. There we go. It's what's actually being tested. You know, you want to see what's happening, all right? So remember, this refers to the if part of your hypothesis. Now, the responding variable is what's going to happen when you apply the manipulated variable, all right? Now, this will be the change that you can see. It's going to be observed and measured. Now, when you see these words observed and especially measured, you need to think of the word data or data. It don't matter. You can pronounce it any way you want to. All right. So the manipulated variable is what is actually being tested. The responding variable is what you can measure or observe based upon that manipulated variable. And essentially, you're going to collect the data. So the responding variable is kind of simply just data. All right. Now, let's use the words independent and dependent. Okay. The independent variable is what is actually being tested. The dependent variable is the data that's the produced depending upon the independent variable. There you go. That's it in a nutshell. Five. 
We've collected this data. It's our responding variable that we've gotten from our controlled experiment. Well, what do we do with it? Well, first of all, what the heck is data? All right. Well, data is essentially comes in two flavors. Number one, quantitative, like quantity. These would be numbers. Okay. Any chance we get for numbers, we as scientists, we love that. Because numbers can do all kinds of things for us. You can manipulate them through statistical analysis. You can create graphs, you know, pie charts, line graphs, best fit, you know, bar graphs, all those things that scientists love. You cannot get those unless you have numbers. All right? Now, sometimes you're doing field work. Maybe you're working with animals or, or um, you know, insects, you know, which are also type of animals. You know, you can't collect numbers, so then you've got to describe what they're doing. And this would be qualitative, all right? It's descriptive, all right? Now, over here, look at this little table here. We've got two types of data, quantitative and qualitative. Now, notice over here under qualitative, there's no numbers. But over here under quantitative, you're going to see numbers. So here we got an objective quantitative data. In other words, it's can't really dispute it. The chip speed of my computer is 2 gigahertz. That is a true object. Qualitative is, yes, I own a computer. Hopefully for you, like I have, it's a Mac. All right, subjective. On a scale of 1 to 10, my computer scores a 7 in terms of ease. Now, that's a number. It's quantitative, but it's subjective. It's your opinion, okay? Obviously, since this person didn't score as a 10, they must be using a PC, all right? I think computers are too expensive. I do too, especially when they're Apple computers. All right, but none of that. All right, so here we go. Repeat, why do I want to do this data again? Or why do I want to um, redo my experiment? Because I want to know if my data is consistent. Consistent data really, really hones in that your hypothesis was a good one. Because it's very repeatable over and over again your prediction comes out to be true. Very important in science. We want things that can be shown to happen time and time again. It's, it's great evidence to support your work. <clears throat> All right, let's get that right. All right, final slide for this screencast. Peer review. Peer review, I think, is one of the neatest things when it comes to scientists because basically your work is going to be judged on how good it is. Does the data support your conclusion? And that's done by a panel of your peers, other scientists who work in your field. All right? Now, how do you get your scientific work out to the rest of the world? Well, what you're going to do, is you can probably do it through one of these three ways. All right? You can email another colleague. For example, let's say you're a scientist at the Ohio State University where I went to school, and you have a friend who does the same work that you do, and maybe he works at the University of California in Berkeley. All right, you may email him or her throughout your research and say, hey, this is what my research is, it's doing this, this is what I think is going to happen, and you guys are going to talk back and forth, and that may help guide you. All right, you can always do Skype, FaceTime, face to face interaction with other scientists. But the peer review becomes more formal when it's done in these final two. You can do a presentation at a conference. Um, you know, they may have a big, uh, you know, the you know, American Heart Association. Maybe you're doing research on, on heart attacks. And maybe they have a big meeting in Chicago, and you will present during that convention in a large auditorium. All right? uh, you could do webinars where scientists in your field, they'll just sit down, and, and using webcams and whatnot, they'll be able to discuss and go over the work. Um, one of these that's been around for over hundreds of years is publishing in a scientific journal. And over here we got pictures of two scientific journals, and they're actually two of the more important ones in the world. Uh, this one over here, this is Science Magazine. This one is published in the United States, and it's probably the number one scientific journal in the U.S., and it covers chemistry, physics, biology, etc. All right, Nature is from the United Kingdom, you know, London, England, and this is the most widely read scientific journal in the world. And if you are a scientist that's published in either one of these two, you've kind of arrived. 
All right. So um, don't forget in class, if you have any questions, don't forget to ask your teacher about this. And remember, this is a really big part of chapter one. So when it's time for you to take a test or a quiz, feel free to review this screencast over and over. You know, the beauty of this is you get to watch this as many times as you want to help you review. All right. Until next time, good luck in your biology class.